Gabby Petito never goes outside. <laughs> Road trips are the ultimate test of any relationship. There's something about the vast expanse of nothingness stretching before you that can either pull you apart or push you together. Gabby Petito wanted a life on the open road. She worked in a juice bar, saved her money, converted her van into a home, and left New York in June to chase that dream with her boyfriend, Brian Laundrie. Hello, hello, and good morning. Um, so, me and Brian just got up and got ready, made the bed in the tent, set up. Um, I think our plan for today is to just hang out here in the tent. Um, Brian's stretching, doing some morning yoga. It was just her, him, and a camera sharing their van life adventures online. So, we are right outside Capitol Reef right now in a uh, free dispersed camp spot. And we've been lucky so far at all the places we've stayed, but I'd say this is one of the best so far. Since we left New York, I've only set up my hammock once. <laughs> and now we're all the way in Utah, and luckily enough, I was able to set up my hammock in one of these trees. And we're kind of like in the desert. <laughs> Very few trees. <laughs> I love the van. How did things go from that to this? A description of the Hi, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower and... We're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Of Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, Where's about it five six beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street. They made a uh, a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. Or what were they doing? Cooperative, but um, what do you say? What were they doing? Uh, we drove by, and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her. Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. Okay, you said uh, it's a white van? White van, I give you the, I give you the license plate if you give me one sec. I took okay. a picture of it. Then it got much worse. 31 days after she posted her first and last Nomadic Static YouTube video, Gabby was dead. And Brian is the target of a massive manhunt. How did things go so wrong? Good to see you. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. It's official. The coroner has ruled Gabby's death a homicide. Police released the search warrant used to comb Gabby's van for clues about her murder. Here's what we found out. This bizarre message was sent from her phone on August 27th. Can you help, Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. What the... Stan is Gabby's grandfather, but the 22-year-old never called him by his first name, and beyond that, why would she ask about him at that point? Then, even stranger, her phone was powered down and her social media went dark. No one heard from her for three days. Then her mom got this strange message on August 30th. No service in Yosemite. And she doesn't believe her daughter wrote either of those messages. In fact, that 911 call on August 12th marked a boiling point in the tension that had been building between Brian and Gabby in the two months they were trapped together in a van on the highways and byways of America. On the same day the 911 call came in, the couple was pulled over in Moab, Utah for erratic driving, but neither of them wanted to press charges, saying they were in love and engaged to be married. But it wasn't quite the Hallmark card it sounded like. Problems in the relationship had already escalated to abuse. It may not have been the first time. Friends say Brian could be jealous, controlling, and isolating. Those three words signal big problems. But in Utah, just weeks before her body was found, their very public argument was labeled a mental-slash-emotional health break and not a domestic assault. The long days spent alone together were magnifying her anxiety and bringing out the worst in Brian. But one park ranger told the Desert News she implored her to reevaluate the relationship and asked her if she was happy in the relationship with him. She basically told her this was an opportunity for her to find another path to make a change in her life. But Gabby stayed with her high school sweetheart. Although that night, police say the two of them were separated. He got a free night in a hotel courtesy of the state of Utah, and Gabby got the keys to the van since it was in her name. 
On August 23rd or 24th, she made her last FaceTime call to her parents. In that conversation, she said they were leaving Utah and heading for Grand Teton National Park. From there, it took a tribe of van lifers collaborating on social media and with the police to unravel what Brian was allegedly doing for those missing few days between Gabby's last FaceTime on the 24th and the day he pulled into Northport, Florida at 1026 a.m. on September 1st. Alone. So, let's hear from the witnesses themselves. This is what Jessica saw on August 26th. Uh, Brian Laundry parking his van August 26th at Sprite Creek. So I'd already reported to the FBI what I had seen, so I, and I wasn't 100% sure, but now that there's dash cam footage of the van where I saw it, I'm 100% certain that I did see him parking his van. And he was very kind of awkward and confused, and it was just him, there was no Gabby, but that's only because as a van lifer, I was checking out their van, and I was checking out to see if it was a couple or a solo dude. So it was a solo dude, as far as I could see, unless she was in the back somewhere. But when I pulled up, he was driving still and hadn't yet pulled over. So I was like, hey, what are you going to do? Are you going to get over? Are you going to let me pass? Because it's only one car width of a road. And he kind of pulled over like halfway and made me drive out of the road to go around him. So I thought it was just really weird. She noticed it was there until August 29th. On August 27th, the day after Jessica spotted the van driving on that narrow road, another Van Life family found themselves on that same road searching for a campsite in the Spread Creek area of the Bridger Teton National Forest. As they were driving by, they happened to capture this video showing the van pulled off to the side of the road. And we passed by their van or a white van. And the white van had Florida plates. And we were excited because, like, we're Florida, you know, hometown Tampa Bay. And so we wanted to stop and talk to them. But they, uh, the van was dark. It was all closed up. It really didn't look like anyone was there or somebody was sleeping. And so we just kept on going. It was very, very busy in there. So we just turned around, came back, and then went up to the front gravel lot to park because we couldn't find anywhere else. You should know that even though the area was busy, like she said, the campsites are isolated, set back from the road and private. That might be why Gabby's body was left about 200 yards from the road near the area where his van was parked. A memorial of stones in the shape of a cross marks the spot now. But here's where the story gets even stranger. On August 29th, Brian allegedly hitched a ride. Hi, my name is Miranda Baker, and on August 29th, my boyfriend and I picked up Brian at Grand Teton National Park at 5.30 at night at Coulter Bay. Um, I'm hoping this can help someone identify him because I saw him from TikTok, which then made me call the authorities and... Um, my boyfriend and I have been in contact with a bunch of different people to help um, piece together different parts of this case, but we picked him up at Coulter Bay, like I said, at 5.30. He approached us asking us for a ride because he needed to go to Jackson, which we were going to Jackson that night. So I said, you know, hop in. Um, he hopped in the back of my Jeep. We then, you know, proceeded to make small talk, um, but before he came in the car, he offered to pay us like $200 to give him a ride. like. 10 miles so that was kind of weird um he then told us he's been camping for multiple days without his fiance he did say he had a fiance and that she was working on their social media page back at their van um then once like in conversation i brought up yep like we're going to jackson um he freaked out he's like nope i need to get out right now um you know like pull over so we pulled over at the jackson dam which I don't know if you're, um, if you know like Teton Park, but it's not very far from Coulter Bay. And if this does like reach people, I can post pictures of, you know, exactly where we were. We picked him up and the whole route or whatever, and like screenshots of like the timestamps. We dropped him off at 6:09 p.m. on August 29th. Um, he kind of like hurried out of the car, and then he's like, "Okay, I'm just gonna go find someone else to, you know, hitchhike." And we're like, "Okay." Um, it, it was a weird situation. So when we picked him up, he was wearing a backpack. He had a long sleeve, pants, hiking boots, and he had like scruff. Um, 
but he didn't look dirty for someone who was camping for multiple days like he didn't look dirty he didn't smell dirty so that part was kind of weird as context Coulter Bay where they allegedly picked him up is about 26 minutes from the Spread Creek area where Gabby's body was found the police haven't confirmed that Brian was the man they gave the ride to but she sounds pretty sure of it so if it was him what was he doing so far away from the van and why offer $200 for a ride then jump out of the car at some point, possibly later on August 29th, because that's the last time the van was seen in the Spread Creek area, Brian drove 34 hours from Wyoming to Northport, Florida, arriving alone on September 1st. Ten days later, her mom reported Gabby missing, and Brian didn't stick around for long. According to his family, he grabbed his backpack and left on September 14th. They claim he told them he was going hiking in Florida's Carlton Reserve. Since Gabby's body was found just five days later, on September 19th, you could say allegedly he escaped to Florida's Carlton Reserve. The area covers 25,000 acres of swamplands, complete with alligators and other wild animals, and he had a pretty good head start since his family didn't tell police he was gone for three days. And that's assuming he left on the 14th, like they claimed. Which brings up the question, at what point does protecting your child become aiding and abetting? That's a question Brian Laundrie's parents will need to answer, if not to themselves, then to the police and to Gabby's family. Their house, the van, and Brian's sister's house have all been searched with electronics and boxes hauled out. Social media is the modern version of the missing persons photos on the milk cartons, which means that even though Brian and his family weren't talking, thousands of strangers across the country were willing to help. Now, thanks to them, they found Gabby in thousands of acres of isolated wilderness. Now, Brian will have to try and stay hidden from an entire world of social media detectives. Good luck, buddy. Meanwhile, it seems camping in the American West can be a very dangerous prospect because another couple was murdered in the Moab area around the same time, and their case shares a bizarre connection to Gabby and Brian. Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner were last seen leaving Woody's Tavern on Moab on August 13th. The next day, the married couple headed into the nearby LaSalle Mountains to go camping, something they loved to do and did as often as they could. They were experienced enough to know that in the great outdoors, it's humans that pose the biggest threat. So when they got spooked by a weird guy camping near them, they told other people about it and moved campsites. That was August 14th. Four days went by without a word. A worried friend tracked them down on August 18th. They'd been shot to death and left in a creek near their campsite. But here's where it gets even stranger. One day before Kylan and Crystal were last seen, Brian and Gabby were fighting in front of the Moonflower Co-op in Moab. That's when the 911 caller alerted police. But this is where their two stories cross paths. Kylan worked at that store. She was a favorite cashier there for the last four years. I mean, that's a hell of a coincidence, don't you think? But police say that's all it is. They checked it out to see if they could find a link to Brian and Gabby, but they decided there's nothing there. I mean, what do you think? Does that connection deserve a second look? And if it is unrelated, then who shot those women and why? Strange goings on in the great outdoors. Be aware, be careful, and stay vigilant, my friends. Wild animals aren't the only creatures to be afraid of. Thanks for spending your time with me today. These cases are developing fast, so please check out the pinned comment below for updates, and we hope you will keep up with both these cases and other crimes in half the time, so remember to subscribe and give this a thumbs up so you never miss a recap. Until next time, stay safe.